In this video, we're going to take another look at covalent bonds through another theory of bonding, which is known as molecular orbital theory. After watching this video and doing some problems, you should be able to use molecular orbital theory to explain bonding, particularly in diatomic molecules. In another video, we looked at valence bond theory and hybridization. In this theory, bonding is due to the overlap of atomic orbitals, and in order to accurately explain molecular shapes, we consider the hybridization or mixing of the atomic orbitals. Valence bond theory is also able to predict properties such as bond strength and rigidity through the introduction of sigma and pi bonds. However, this theory does have some limitations, particularly in that it assumes that the electrons are localized and many molecules have pi bonds that exhibit electron delocalization. Additionally, some other properties such as para or diamagnetism are not explainable at all through valence bond theory. In the rest of this video, we will explore another theory of bonding that can address some of these deficiencies. In molecular orbital theory, electrons are no longer assigned to specific atomic orbitals, but are just considered to belong to the entire molecule. In practice, it is not possible to solve the Schrodinger equation exactly for this type of a system. So an approximation that is made is that the molecular orbitals are due to the interactions of atomic orbitals. This method is called the linear combination of atomic orbitals. And since the orbitals are wave functions, they can still interact in positive and negative ways. This is similar to what happens with hybridization, but in hybridization, we were looking at the mixing of orbitals on a single atom. And in MO theory, we're gonna be looking at mixing that occurs between orbitals on different atoms. So if we think about the two 1s functions that we would have for two hydrogen atoms, they can interact in a positive manner, forming a bonding orbital, or in a negative manner, forming an antibonding orbital. The positive interaction where the 1s orbitals are in phase leads to the lower energy bonding orbital. And when they're out of phase, it leads to a higher energy antibonding orbital. In general, every interaction of atomic orbitals leads to a bonding and an antibonding molecular orbital. The bonding orbitals result from the constructive combination of orbitals and correspond to sigma or pi bonds and have a high probability of the electron being found directly between the nuclei. Antibonding molecular orbitals result from the destructive combination of, of the atomic orbitals and are labeled as sigma star or pi star. These orbitals have nodes or regions with no probability of finding the electrons between the nuclei. Molecular orbital theory is often described using molecular orbital diagrams. Here's the example for H2, where we have the separate atomic orbitals for each hydrogen atom, and then show the molecular orbitals in between. There's always a bonding and an antibonding molecular orbital that results from the interactions of the atomic orbitals. And when we consider where to put the electrons in the molecular orbitals, we always start filling from the bottom up the same way we did in the atomic electron configurations using the Aufbau principle. If we happen to have degenerate orbitals, we would also put in one electron for each of those before we started pairing them, which was from Hund's rules. Again, the same way that we would fill them in atomic orbitals. In this case, each hydrogen atom has one electron, so we end up with two electrons in the bonding molecular orbital for hydrogen, and we would interpret this as a single bond forming between the two hydrogen atoms. If we consider the same diagram for helium, the only difference is the number of electrons. Now, both 1s orbitals on the atoms are filled, and so there are a total of four electrons. When we fill the molecular orbitals from lowest to highest energy, both the bonding and antibonding levels are filled. From this, we would understand that the helium dimer is not stable. Its bonding electrons are basically counteracted by the corresponding antibonding electrons. We can formalize the discussion on hydrogen and helium through the discussion of bond order. Bond order is simply the difference in the number of bonding and antibonding electrons divided by two. This definition does mean that we can end up with a fractional bond. An example of a fractional bond would be for helium two plus, which is the helium dimer with one electron removed. In that case, there would be two bonding and one antibonding electron, which would give a bond order of one half. So even though helium is a noble gas and does not form a dimer regularly, the ion 
can exist as a semi-stable species. The bond would be weaker in helium-2 plus than for hydrogen, but it's still present. In general, a higher bond order will correspond to a shorter bond and a stronger bond. And if our bond order is zero, we would argue that no bond is formed and the atoms are more stable separated than together. As with valence bond theory, in molecular orbital theory, it is only necessary to consider the valence electrons as the core electrons will always be in orbitals that are both bonding and antibonding. And so they do not contribute to the overall bond. Finally, we can also use MO theory to determine the magnetic properties of molecules. If there are unpaired electrons, the molecule will be paramagnetic. And if all spins are paired, it would be diamagnetic. Now let's continue looking on in the periodic table. In the case of lithium, we now have an atomic configuration of 1s2, 2s1. So the valence electrons in this case are actually in the 2s level. As we noted, the core 1s electrons are filling both the bonding and antibonding orbitals, and so they can safely be ignored. The 1s electrons are also much lower in energy and are gonna have no effect on the 2s electrons. So we can really focus just on the 2s level and here we have a very similar picture to what we saw in hydrogen. The two lithium atoms each have one electron in an S level. And when they form their bonding and antibonding levels, the bonding level is what is filled. And so we would determine that the lithium dimer has a bond order of one. This will occur if lithium is in the gas phase, although at room temperature, lithium would be a solid and have metallic bonding rather than covalent bonding. Beryllium is the next element on the periodic table and would look the same as this lithium atom, but would have an extra electron. And as in the case of helium, we would conclude that beryllium too is unstable, and there would be electrons filling both the bonding and the antibonding levels. To go beyond beryllium, we also need to consider actions of the two p orbitals. These can combine in a positive or negative fashion, creating bonding and antibonding levels. A sigma and sigma star level are formed from the p orbitals that point along the bonding axis. Again, we notice that the bonding orbital has electron density between the atoms, whereas the antibonding orbital has a node between the atoms. In the p orbitals, there's also a node at the nucleus in both the atomic and the molecular orbitals. The remaining p orbitals are perpendicular to the bonding axis, and they overlap constructively to form a pi bond, which has density above and below the bonding axis, and a pi star antibond, which has a node between the atoms. Since there are two sets of perpendicular p orbitals, there are two pi bonds and two pi star antibonds that can be formed. So now let's consider the molecular orbital diagram for the p block elements. We know from learning about electron configurations that the 2s orbitals are gonna be lower in energy than the 2p orbitals. And we also know that the p orbitals overlap better if they're pointing along the bond, so the sigma orbitals should end up lower in energy than the pi orbitals. This figure shows the expected energy ordering where we have the sigma and sigma star levels formed from the 2s electrons at the lower energy, and then the p orbitals forming sigma and pi bonds at higher energy along with their pi star and sigma star antibonds. For oxygen, fluorine, and neon, this is exactly what we observe, as the 2s and 2p electrons are sufficiently separated in energy, and so they do not interact. In the elements boron, carbon, and nitrogen, the 2s levels and the 2p levels are closer together due to the smaller nuclear charge. This means that the sigma star level from the 2s state can actually interact with the sigma bonding orbital in the 2p state. And so this actually pushes the sigma star level so that it's lower in energy than it typically would be. And it raises the sigma 2p orbital so that it's higher in energy than it would be. So we get a slightly different ordering in the energy level diagram for elements before oxygen than we do for oxygen, fluorine, and neon. Here's another picture of the energies for the 2p elements showing the effect of increasing the nuclear charge on the energy levels. You can see that as the nuclear charge increases, all the levels get somewhat lower in energy. But the only change in ordering actually happens when going from nitrogen to oxygen, where the sigma 2p state ends up crossing from above the pi states to below them. 
This image also shows the correct number of electrons filled in, and you can see that for oxygen, when we fill lowest to highest, there are actually two unpaired electrons. And this explains why O2 is actually magnetic. There will be a link provided in the video description that you can check out if you want to see the effect of this. There are similar pictures that can be drawn for higher principal quantum number states, but in general, the atomic states get closer together, and so more mixings become possible which means it's even more difficult to predict the ordering without additional information. And so for purposes of this class, if you do encounter elements with higher principal quantum numbers, you'll be given information on the ordering of the molecular orbitals so that you can answer any questions. So far, we've discussed homonuclear diatomics, which have identical atoms. And so the atomic orbital energies are equal and the contribution of the molecular orbitals is equal. If different types of atoms are involved, the atomic orbitals have different energies, and generally the atomic orbitals that are closest in energy to the molecular orbital will determine its character. This means that the lower energy atomic orbitals that typically come from the more electronegative elements contribute more to bonding molecular orbitals, and higher energy orbitals contribute more to the anti-bonding molecular orbitals. We can also have cases, particularly when hydrogen is involved, where there is no interaction of the orbitals on one atom with the orbitals on the other atom. In this case, we would call the leftover orbitals non-bonding, and they stay on the atom that they originally belonged to. Here's the general picture for a heteronuclear diatomic molecule involving 2s and 2p electrons. And you can see that the general ordering stays the same as for the homonuclear diatomics. But there's an asymmetry where the bonding orbitals are going to look more similar to the higher electronegativity element, and the antibonding orbitals are more similar to the less electronegative elements. This is the same picture for the NO molecule with the correct number of valence electrons filled in. The shape of the sigma 2s and the sigma star 2s are also shown, and you can see that there is slightly more electron density on the oxygen in the bonding orbital and slightly more on the nitrogen in the antibonding orbital. Here's another example, which is the molecular orbital diagram for hydrogen fluoride. In this case, the 1s electron on hydrogen is what interacts with the 2p electron on fluorine. And so these come together to form a bonding orbital, where, which looks mostly like a p orbital on fluorine, and an antibonding orbital, which looks mostly like the 1s orbital on hydrogen. The remaining s and p orbitals that are shown here are non-bonding and are just part of the fluorine atom. Finally, we should note that both valence bond and molecular orbital theory can be expanded to include additional atoms. In the valence bond model, bonds are always between two atoms, while in the molecular orbital theory model, they can spread out over the whole molecule. The case of ozone illustrates the difference in these models. In valence bond theory, we have to think about this molecule as an average structure involving one single bond and one double bond. And since the three oxygen atoms are equivalent, it doesn't matter if we draw the double bond on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. This concept is called resonance and will be explored in more detail in another video. In molecular orbital theory, there's no need for these separate structures as the pi orbital can actually spread out over the whole molecule, in this case, all three atoms. We would call this a delocalized bond as the electrons in this pi orbital are able to spread out over all the atoms and are not stuck just in between two. That's all for this video. I hope you've learned something more about bonding and are able to see that there's different models that give us different information and help us understand how molecules are formed.